Welcome. Welcome to this congregation where we seek to foster community, to grow our spirits, to serve others, and to work for justice. We are glad that you're here with us today in our cyberspace, and we hope that you'll experience love, acceptance, and inspiration. After the service, please join us for our Zoom coffee hour. And I will get us to our service. So today we'll continue with our monthly touchstone themes that help us shape our days and guide our journeys. Our November topic, as you're aware, has been all about spirituality, which involves a heightened sense of connection with the deepest part of oneself, with others, and with a transcendent reality. However, that is understood by you. Spirituality has to do with a desire for wholeness and the cultivation of the inner life that we might live with more authenticity, integrity, humility, and compassion. Today, we're fortunate to have with us Reverend Kate Rohde. Reverend Kate retired several years ago after 34 years as a parish minister, serving all over the country and in Canada. She is Minister Emerita of the Unitarian Congregation of Westchester, where she served for 17 years. She spent one of her sabbaticals living in Nuevo Gaucho in Usalatan, El Salvador, and she and her husband have recently returned to Westchester where they live with their cat, Muppet. Her message for us today is titled, Are We Still Searching for the Grand Falloon? And I had to ask her, if that was how it was properly pronounced. She says that Kurt Vonnegut in his novel, Cat's Cradle, talks about the grand falloon and illusionary connections versus the important invisible ones that get God's work done. In these days of identity politics, teams and social bubbles, there are more, maybe more grand falloons than ever. Maybe it's time for us to do a little retake on what connects us. Now, let us enter into worship together. Our prelude is brought to us by our musician, Avi Wisnia, with a song entitled, Bleed the Saint. We're more beautiful when we come together. We all bleed the same. So tell me why, tell me why we're divided. I woke up today, another headline, another innocent life is taken in the name of hatred. So hard to take. And if you think that it's all good, then we're mistaken Cause my heart is breaking Are you left? Are you right? Pointing fingers, taking sides When are we gonna realize we all be the same? We're more beautiful when we come together We all bleed the same So tell 
judge someone by the kind of clothes they're wearing or the color of their skin are you black are you white aren't we the same inside can't we open our eyes to see we all bleed the same we're more beautiful when we come together we all darkness what are we fighting for we were made to carry one another we were made for more only love can drive out the darkness what are we fighting for we were made to carry one another we were made for more Thank you, Avi. As always, that music is so special. And now, Colleen Stahl will light our chalice this morning, so read the words along as she does so. We light our chalice this morning, grateful for the love that we experience in this beloved community. May this flame light our way to inner peace, to love for each other, and faith in ourselves. Thank you, Colleen. The opening words for today's service are brought to us by Reverend Kenneth Pfeiffer. Spirituality is an attitude. Part of what is involved in spirituality is a stance, a commitment, a will. What we see and understand is partly determined by what we are trying to see and understand. Whatever the ultimate truth may be, we are both aided and limited in our finite grasp of it by what we expect to find. Spirituality is an attitude towards reality. And now, Angela Conan, our Director of Religious Exploration, will bring us a message for all ages. Let's listen. Good morning, everybody. In keeping with the worship theme of spirituality this month, I have a lovely little story for you called A Stone Sat Still. I have to say it slowly because it's a little bit of a tongue twister for me. So here we go with A Stone Sat Still. A stone sat still with the water, grass, and dirt, and it was as it was, where it was in the world. And the stone was dark, and the stone was bright, and the stone was loud, and the stone was quiet. And it sat where it sat with the water, grass, and dirt, and it was as it was where it was in the world. And the stone was rough, 
and the stone was smooth. And the stone was green, red, purple, and blue. And the stone was a pebble. And the stone was a hill. And the stone was a feel. And the stone was a smell. And it sat where it sat with the water, grass, and dirt. And it was as it was, where it was in the world. And the stone was the wild. And the stone was a home. And the stone was a kitchen. And the stone was a throne. And the stone was a marker and a map and a maze. A danger, a haven, a story, a stage. And the stone was a blink, and the stone was an age. And the stone was an island, and the stone was a wave. And the stone was a memory and the stone was always. Have you ever known such a place where with water, grass, and dirt, a stone sits still in the world? That's the end of our story. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks. Thank you, Angela. I found that almost meditative. And now Avi Wisnia returns with a musical interlude on a little tune that I think you'll find very familiar. It's a world of laughter, a world of tears It's a world of hopes and a world of fears There's so much that we share that it's time We're aware it's a small world after all 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 It's a small, small world There is just one moon and one golden sun And the smile means friendship to everyone Though the mountains divide and the oceans are wide It's a small world after all 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 It's a small, small world It's a small world after all It's a small world after all it's a small world after all, it's a small, small world. Thanks, Avi. I could tell that that put a smile on everybody's face on this gray morning and maybe even brought uh, a little toe tapping and wishes for the times when we can get back to Disneyland. So now I would like to 
invite uh, Reverend Kate to provide us with a reading. Good morning. It's good to be back with you, if only virtually. Um, my reading this morning is from Cat's Cradle, one of, uh, well, it's my second favorite Kurt Vonnegut book, and it's actually was his second favorite. The first um, part of the reading is from chapter two. <clears throat> if you find your life tangled up in someone else's life for no very logical reasons, writes Bokanen, that person may be a member of your Karas. At another point in the books of Bokanan, he says, he tells us, man created the checkerboard, God created the Karas. By that, he means that a Karas ignores national, institutional, occupational, familial, and class boundaries. It's as free form as an amoeba. In his 53rd Calypso, Bokanan invites us to sing along with him. Oh, a sleeping drunkard up in Central Park and a lion hunter in the jungle dark and a Chinese dentist and a British queen all fit together in the same machine. Nice, nice, very nice, 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 very nice. So many different people in the same device. And from chapter 41. There was a saloon in the rear of the plane and I repaired there for a drink. It was there that I met another American, H. Lowe Crosby of Evanston, Illinois, and his wife, Hazel. They were heavy people in their 50s. They spoke twangingly. Crosby told me that he owned a bicycle factory in Chicago, that he had had nothing but ingratitude from his employees. He was going to move his business to grateful San Lorenzo. You know San Lorenzo well, I asked. This will be the first time I've ever seen it, but everything I've heard about it, I like, said H. Lowe Crosby. They've got discipline. They've got something you can count on from one year to the next. They don't have the government encouraging everybody to be some kind of original pissant nobody ever heard of before. Sir, Christ, back in Chicago, we don't make bicycles anymore. It's all human relations now. The eggheads sit around trying to figure out new ways for everybody to be happy. Nobody can get fired, no matter what. And if somebody does accidentally make a bicycle, the union accuses us of cruel and inhuman practices and the government confiscates the bicycle for back taxes and gives it to a blind beggar in Afghanistan. And you think things will be better in San Lorenzo. No damn well they will be. The people down there are poor enough and scared enough and ignorant enough to have some common sense. Crosby asked me what my name was and what my business was. I told him and his wife Hazel recognized my name as an Indiana name. She was from Indiana too. My God, she said, are you a Hoosier? I admitted that I was. I'm a Hoosier too, she crowed. Nobody has to be ashamed of being a Hoosier. I'm not, I said. I never knew anyone who was. Hoosiers do all right. Lo and I have been around the world twice and everywhere we went, we found Hoosiers in charge of everything. That's reassuring. You know, the manager of that new hotel in Istanbul? No, he's a Hoosier and the military, whatever he is in Tokyo? Attaché, said her husband. He's a Hoosier, said Hazel. And the new ambassador to Yugoslavia? A Hoosier? 
not only him, but the Hollywood editor of Life Magazine too, and that man in Chile. A Hoosier too? You can't go anywhere. A Hoosier hasn't made his mark, she said. The man who wrote Ben-Hur was a Hoosier and James Whitcomb Riley. Are you from Indiana too, I asked her husband. Nope, I'm a prairie stater. Land of Lincoln, as they say. As far as that goes, Lincoln was a Hoosier too. He grew up in Spencer County. Sure, I said. I don't know what it is about Hoosiers, said Hazel, but they've got something. If someone was to make a list, they'd be amazed. That's true, I said. She grasped me firmly by the arm. We Hoosiers have to stick together. Right. You call me mom. What? Whenever I meet a young Hoosier, I tell them, you call me mom. Uh-huh. Let me hear you say it, she urged. Mom. She let go of my arm. Some piece of clockwork had completed its cycle. My calling Hazel, mom, had shut it off and Hazel was rewinding it for the next Hoosier to come along. Hazel's obsession with Hoosiers around the world was a textbook example of a false Karas, a seeming team that was meaningless in terms of the way God gets things done. A textbook example of what Bokanen calls a grand balloon. Others examples of grand balloons are the Communist Party, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the General Electric Company, the International Order of Odd Fellows, identity groups, and any nation, any time, anywhere. As Bokanen invites us to sing along with him, if you wish to study a grand balloon, just remove the skin of a toy balloon. Thank you, Reverend Kate. Thought provoking. Um, all November, we've been talking about our split plate collection, uh, which in the month of November benefits the Race for Hope, the National Brain Tumor Society. Brain cancer has affected all kinds of people, even claiming the life of our keyboard player and friend, Wayne Isaacs, as well as the life of Dove Wisnia brother to our friend and current musician, Avi. You can help us honor their lives and those of so many others who've suffered by participating in the Race for Hope through our split plate donation. As you know, Race for Hope would occur in person in Philadelphia and many other places around the country, but because of COVID, couldn't take place this year. But the need is definitely still very great. So please give with your heart. You'll find a link to our split plate donation in the chat box or in our UUFLB newsletter. And you can also mail a check to the uh, UUFLB offices. Just be sure that you make a note on the check that it's for a split plate donation. And we thank you in advance for your generosity. And now I turn back to Reverend Kate for her sermon message. Reverend Kate. Thank you. When we celebrate the birth of a baby, we celebrate the beginning. But the beginning of what? For life was there nestled inside mother months before birth and years ago, the cells that joined together to create that life were living cells, part of the people who became parents. Birth is the first separation. 
Now I am separate, not a part of another, my mother. I am born, I am me, I am separate, I am unique, I am different. What must it have been like to be pushed suddenly from the warm, wet darkness where our every need was instantly satisfied out into the world of light and chill, cut forever from that being that gave us life? Myth has it that our first yell is a yell of protest as air enters the lungs and we become a part of the world. There's another myth that says there are some few souls who can't wait to be born, who would, if they could, leap from womb to world, and whose first cry is a cry of joy. But the skeptic in me doubts that story. I see so few human souls who choose challenge over comfort, few who joy in the frightening edge. Yet perhaps I'm wrong. It's Scarcely parental prodding that makes the child begin to move on her own, to take his first step, to tell us no, with most emphatic diction, to separate further and further from her family, to become a more distinct, different human personality. God knows it's scarcely parental prodding behind our teenagers' drive towards separation, his efforts to be different in every aspect from his parents, to separate himself from familial expectations and identification. Perhaps there is that within us which drives us towards the differentiation of maturity, the adventure of becoming, even when that becoming means leaving the comforts of familiarity. Perhaps there is something pushing us toward a joyful birth. Most of us would probably not be in a Unitarian Universalist congregation this morning if we did not have something within us that wished to joyfully birth and lovingly nurture our own individual uniqueness. If we wished to be comfortable and undistinguished, we probably would not have come to this oddball faith, which so constantly preaches the value of diversity. Unitarian Universalism is based on the philosophy that human diversity is something to be embraced, not feared. And during the last three and a half decades, I've often found a remarkable openness amongst us. In many congregations I've served, we've heard hardworking humanists, dedicated deists and convinced Christians and passionate pagans with a willingness to consider what we heard. Still, truth to tell, most of us tend to search for the grand balloon, the artificial teams which reassure us we are not so different, but part of an embracing whole connected to mom. It's comforting to know there are others like us, that we can immerse ourselves in the safety of our group and never have to deal with that fear that some differences seem to invoke for us. I have to admit that a lot of Unitarian Universalists, when you ask them, say they come to church looking for people who think like they do. And we often don't just mean that we have a similar approach. We often mean that we hold similar prejudices and preferences. We tend to cluster in certain demographic enclaves of people of a similar age or ethnicity or profession or political ideas or such like. At some level, difference is a threat to each of us. Other beings have needs different than my own. The competition is threatening. Other beings have power to shape my world. My sense of autonomy is threatened. Other beings see, understand, and act differently. My mind and senses are in question. We have all experienced that kind of 
not a fear in the stomach, that feeling of threat. And sometimes that threat is very real. Two people want something that only one can have. One person's desire may mean harm to me. Your needs may conflict with my needs. More often, however, differences evoke a gut level feeling of fear whose origins we can't quite identify. Think for a moment of ideas or persons or ways of doing things that you tend to draw away from, things that make you squirm in your seat when you see or hear them. Why do you fear them? Or if fear isn't the right word, why do you feel so strongly about that difference? What makes it hard to reach out to somebody with that difference? Most of us, especially those of a certain age, were brought up in times more racist, more sexist, and more homophobic than our own. As a kid, many of the cartoons on TV and many of the children's books I read were so offensively racist, they would not be tolerated by almost anyone today. Children my age were programmed by the media to view Black people as savages or ignorant and foolish. I still think the media does a lot of programming that shapes all kinds of prejudices, especially racial prejudice. I was fortunate enough to have had counter-programming by family, friends, and church, and to have had many life experiences which helped counter the racist programming of the general culture. But it took a great deal of conviction and work by me, by people I knew, and by the culture at large to bring me and people with my experiences to a place where we overcame that programming. Similarly, I had to overcome homophobic and sexist programming. I dare say though, as hard as we may have worked, there's always more to learn in overcoming our fears of difference. Even when we are the different person, some of the most sexist people I've ever met were women. Some of the most infamous anti-gay people have been powerful gay men like Herbert Hoover. Think for example, how hard it is to accept differences even in trivial things. Housework, for example. I wager almost every single one of you has lived with someone who either thought you were a lazy slob or an obsessive compulsive neat freak. Some of us have been called both, depending on the vantage point of the roommate. Although I am clearly more of an Oscar Madison than a Felix Unger, I have had more than one roommate that thought I was too fussy. When there's a large difference, people will start throwing up morality. My way is the way of the decent, moral, thoughtful person. Your way is the way of uncaring degenerates. Perhaps that's why I lived alone for 25 years before remarrying. So if housework can quickly become a moral issue, you can understand more easily why nations have a hard time living in peace. Many marriages go aground on such seemingly trivial issues, not so much the issues themselves as a sense that being different is being bad, crazy, unloving. Family therapist Virginia Satir has told us that the ability to tolerate difference and not to make it into a moral issue is a primary prerequisite for a healthy family. It's my opinion that it's also the prerequisite for a workable democracy and a peaceful world. Yet now, more than ever, we still tend to search for the grand balloon. We tend to build communities of people who don't differ greatly from ourselves, bubbles, we now call them. There are millions of people in North America who have never had a serious and deep conversation with a person of a 
strongly different religion or perhaps a different race or a different ethnicity or a strongly different political point of view. I remember at my first job long ago, I was a nursery school teacher on a staff where I was the only European American. Part of my job was to help an older African American janitor put away the children's cots after their afternoon nap. Every day as we worked, we talked about everything the way you do sometimes with a coworker when you're engaged together in a task. And after many weeks, he said to me, you know, when I was coming up, white and black never socialized together. You are the first white woman I've ever talked to like this. Now the man must have been in his 60s. I was in my 20s and I was both grateful and sad at this admission. And indeed, although for me, it was not the only kind of experience I'd ever had like that. It was a rare one then, rarer still, because we also came from different parts of the country were nearly two generations apart and had widely differing educations. The media talks about lifestyle communities and the more and more common practice of people of similar income, age, race, marital status, affectional orientation and family alignment, forming their own separate communities. How many of our children, for example, even in better times, went through their days without seeing any older people? How many go through their growing up years without getting to know anyone very different from their parents and themselves? And we like to think of our churches as diverse, but if you look at our demographics, we are remarkably homogenous. Indeed, we are actively becoming more so. Social media, especially, is designed to reinforce our particular worldview show us things that support what we already think and like. Our country is now so polarized that huge numbers of people think the people that didn't vote like they did are not just wrong, but nefarious and evil. From my point of view, equally bad for us, I think, are the people who are kind of even in our bubble, who nonetheless, if we veer from the path of the true believer, will go after us with a vengeful heart, often in mobs, to cancel us socially, go after our jobs, go after our rep reputations, make being friends with us toxic. This kind of cancel culture has taken hold among Unitarian Universalists, especially among newer clergy, a couple of the seminaries, and the UUA. For me, as it must be for any Unitarian Universalist who takes seriously our faith's call for pluralism, it's an important spiritual problem. There is certainly a part of me that really enjoys being around people like myself, people who share my point of view, have experienced similar experiences, speak the same language, like the same things. Still, though I may feel a bit scared or intimidated by what is strange to me, I've learned the most in my relationships with people very, very different than I am. They've had more to teach me. I learned more from the prisoners I worked with in a Georgia prison or the peasants I lived with in El Salvador or the working class black families that ran and used the preschool I worked in than I have from other liberal white educated Americans. The experiences that challenged and changed my life have been experiences interacting with people who showed me a very different way to see the world through the lens of their experiences. The spiritual way means venturing beyond the safety 
of our grand balloons, our teams, and meet the people in our larger hurrahs, the people who will teach us to go deeper, to see more than we can from our tiny corner of reality and connect us more deeply with the world. I can still feel threatened by differences. My head knows better, but I still get the knot in my stomach sometimes. I still squirm in my seat. We all have our biases, our assumptions, our belief that we know something about people, by how they look, where they're from, their education, their accent, their ethnicity, their gender, their age. This person is my kind that person isn't. This difference is good, diversity, that difference is bad. Something in us has not accepted the fact that two quite different ideas or persons can exist and both can be good. We are uncertain of ourselves. We feel we have to deny the validity of the other to create our own identity. Among Unitarian Universalists, it's used to be, it used to be that religious differences were the ones we had difficulty bridging. The scientific positivists suggested that mystical theists were un-Unitarian and ought to leave the church. I don't see why they're Unitarians. They might as well be Baptists if they think like that, they would say. While well, some of the more theistic among us have called the small lecture-oriented fellowships Christ-hating savages and suggested they become an ethical culture society. And lots of us have stories like I do of bringing a friend to a UU gathering, hoping to pique their interest only to have a fellow Unitarian Universalist make some comment about Catholics or Baptists or Christian and offend our friends with their animus. It's scarcely great modeling of the pluralistic tolerance we affirm. And in most of our fellowships and churches, it becomes apparent rather quickly that you better not be a Republican. These days, the divides are indirectly about religion. More often, they're about the identity wars. Do you want someone in your church if they don't want to defund the police or have qualms about abortion or have conservative views about sexuality? Would you welcome someone who hadn't finished high school, a libertarian or a Republican? We like to say we are unorthodox, but in Many, perhaps most of our churches, and even more in our ministry, there is a creeping orthodoxy of opinion. Not only are we almost all Democrats or much further left, but it is more acceptable to be a Berniecrat or a member of the Black Lives Matter than something moderate. Indeed, many ministers and lay people are under fire or canceled for our non-orthodox opinions. One dear colleague was recently hounded out of the ministry altogether through character assassination and internet mobbing, and others have been made so unwelcome they have shrunk away merely because the mob has decided to cancel them. Some ministers speak of free speech and even logic with contempt, and many, many are more fearful than Catholics to express an unorthodox opinion. We Unitarian Universalists are under the same temptation as everyone else to impose our own orthodoxies, to think others are not just different, but bad. When I look for pluralistic images, many different ones come to mind. In the Old Testament, it's the story of Noah's Ark, where God tells Noah that he wants all different kinds of birds and animals brought on board. He needs diversity in creation. I have an image of the Jesus who befriended the rich and the poor, fishermen, 
tax collectors, the worst among them, children, women, prostitutes, and even Samaritans. A man who modeled a radical openness to human diversity that shocked not only his detractors, but his followers. He lived in the time of purity codes and his radical hospitality included even those others believed were unclean. I had the Canadian image, not the American metaphor of the melting pot, but rather their image is of a great mosaic in which many colors, shapes, and textures come together to make a beautiful picture, yet with each piece unique in color and shape. How different those images are from Vonnegut's Hazel Crosby, who spends her life looking for other Hoosiers. The Unitarian Universalist way is to value exploration of differences. Hazel's way is to seek confirmation through sameness. The first is the seeking of life's abundance, while the last is an attempt to confirm one's own tiny existence through trivial connections. I fear the Hazels of the world and the Hazel-like parts of myself that are too fearful or lazy to reach beyond what is familiar and comfortable and trivial to find connections that are deep and meaningful. I fear missing my true caress because I'm searching for grand balloons. Well, we all need the comforts of home on occasion. It's spiritual death to shield ourselves from what is other. We've perhaps learned a little about this hunkering down during the pandemic and all the things we miss being by ourselves or with just a few people. The Unitarian Universalist ideal is a unity which celebrates diversity, a heterodoxy, not an orthodoxy. It's not the false unity in which each must give up individual ideas and interesting differences in order to conform to a group norm. Nor is it the rugged individualism where one can exist only apart from or even in opposition to others. We seek to affirm ourselves, yet at the same time, to search out the depths and possibilities that an openness to others offers, that our lives might be enhanced and even changed in those relationships, seeking to be born not once, not twice, but finding the self born into a new world again and again and again. So be it. Thank you, Reverend Kate, for those um, very thought provoking words. Uh, it, it reminds us all that what we need to do uh, to deepen our own spirituality is not only seek out, but embrace differences. So now is the time in our service when we recognize and lift one another up in love. Let us be fully present and listen with open hearts. If there were any joys and sorrows that couldn't be shared with us today, you'll find them in the chat uh, box, but if you are with us and you wish to uh, say something in person, go to participants and click on um, raise hand and we will help you to unmute. And I think the first person I see is Brayden. Brayden, can you go ahead? Hi, it's Joanna and Aaron. Um, so our son Brayden uh, broke his leg on Thursday. Um, and uh, he's already, he's doing fine. He's doing fine um, but we're waiting to hear if he has to have surgery to have it reset. So if you guys could hold him in your heart and lift him up. <laughs> We would really appreciate it. Um, thank you. Thanks. And then I think Jeff Ellis. Am I unmuted? Yes. Okay. Go ahead, Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, I was uh, 
accepted I'm going to be leaving my retirement. I'm retiring. I'm starting to work uh, a part-time job on Monday the 30th. Congratulations, uh, Jeff. Thanks. And now Robin. <clears throat> Hi, it's uh, it's Bill. I just wanted to thank uh, everybody who sent cards for my uh, my father's passing. It's very much appreciated. Uh, the the poem that Glorious uh, sent, I think, was uh, really uh, helpful. So I just wanted to thank everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Uh, anyone else? Just doing a quick scan to see if there's anyone. <coughs> All right, I believe that was everyone. So whether or not you shared today, and if I overlooked you, I would apologize. But if it was joy, we hope that you and know that this community joins you in your celebration, but for any of the sorrows or concerns that we heard expressed, we also hope that you feel our sympathy and our compassion. So let's just take a moment to pause for a moment of gratitude, silent meditation, and prayer. And now Avi returns to give us our closing song, hymn 347, Gather the Spirit. the power our separate fires will kindle one flame witness the mystery of this hour our trials in this light appear all the same gather in peace gather in thanks gather in sympathy now and then gather in hope compassion and strength gather to celebrate once again gather the spirit of heart and mind seeds for the sowing are laid in store nurture in love and conscience refined with body and spirit united once more Gather in peace, gather in thanks, gather in sympathy now and then. Gather in hope, compassion, and strength. Gather to celebrate once again. Gather the spirit growing in all, drawn by the moon and fed by the sun winter to spring and summer to fall the chorus of life resounding as one gather in peace gather in thanks gather in sympathy now and then gather in hope compassion and strength Gather to celebrate once again. Thank you, Avi. And now Colleen returns to help us close our service with the extinguishing of the chalice. Read along the words as she does so. We extinguish our chalice but we keep its light in our hearts. May it light our path as we leave this place and guide our way until we are together again. <laughs>